welcome back to The Right Turn, your one-stop shop for all things fiction writing. I'm your host, author Jordan M. Griffin, and today we'll be talking about a topic that, in my opinion, gets overlooked far too often, the last sentence. We've talked about first sentences already, and rightfully so, as it's the very first introduction a reader has for your writing. But now, it's time to talk about the last experience they will have of any given work. A last sentence leaves a taste in the reader's mouth. Have you ever finished a short story or novel and said, wait, it ended like that? Or even worse, have you said, I could have written that better? I've had whole novels ruined for me because of the way they ended, so it's not unreasonable to say that endings are easily one of the most important parts of a piece of writing. Endings are one of those things that are highly subjective. Unlike first sentences, it's hard to pinpoint objective ways to make a good last sentence. Sometimes a thematic ending works really well. Other times, it sounds way too preachy. Sometimes I really like a short, abrupt ending. Others, I want the author to let me go gently, give me a sense that the characters are going to be okay and that I'm not doing them a disservice by turning away from the page. It's one of those things that you really have to feel out for your own story and pick which one fits the work the best. One thing I can say is that many writers overshoot their last sentence. Just like first sentences, where writers will sort of write themselves into a piece before it really gets going and then have to delete those first couple sentences, writers will tend to hang on to a work longer than the work strictly needs them. It's a natural reaction. I know I hate goodbyes, especially those ones in which I spend a long, unbroken time with someone and then have to go my separate way. The last sentence of your story is a lot like that. You've spent days, weeks, months, even years with these characters. It's understandable that you, like me, might be loath to let them go. Still, it's good to be able to recognize when it's time to get out of there. One way you can do this is to ask yourself a very simple question. Take a piece of writing you're working on right now. Make sure it's complete that you've gotten at least one full draft together. Now, read over what you have. If it's long, like a novel, read just the last couple of pages. If you were not, under any circumstances, allowed to use the endpoint your story currently has, where would you end your story? Look a few sentences back, maybe a few pages back. Is there a place where you've given the reader everything they really need to know? Tied up all those necessary ends? Reread your story with the new ending that you've chosen. How does your understanding of what you've written change? My guess is that you have a spot in your story where you could chop off a few pages or paragraphs. You might hate it, but I encourage you to take those paragraphs and put them in a different document for now. They're not gone forever. They're just in a different place. I actually have a huge document where I store all the lines, paragraphs, and even pages that I cut from works in progress as I edit them. I highly recommend this. It makes it much easier mentally to make those changes that you know need to happen but are so afraid because you don't want to lose precious work. So once you've gotten this new ending, even if you might not like it, give the piece to a trusted person, someone you know will be gentle but honest with you. If you don't have anybody and you don't have a group of writers, you're welcome to send it here. I'd love to give feedback if you're willing to let me look at a story that you're working on. Ask the person to look at the ending specifically and note what feedback they give you. Did they feel like it was a complete ending or no, does it really need those extra pages that you had? Ask them what they would change and don't use the word add when you ask this question, otherwise you'll skew their answer into telling you to add something. But ask them what they would change in order to make the ending make more sense or have more of an emotional impact. Another note about ending sentences. For some reason, I see writers completely shift their tone when getting to the end of a piece. I know there's a lot of weight there, and it's a good thing to treat your last sentence with some gravity. However, I notice that many writers abandon their own unique voice as they near the end of their writing. Funny books suddenly turn serious and kind of heavy. Books written in a really beautiful dialect turn straight and narrow. For whatever reason, authors seem to go into need to make sure the reader understands this mode, and in doing so, they risk losing all of the great work they've put in so far. If you feel like this is happening to you, 
Look through your ending and try to pinpoint where you're losing that tone and voice. Mark it and then cut everything after that. I know, it's scary. Just put it in that other document for now. It's not gone forever. But could the book end right there? Could the book end at the new place? If yes, great, you're done. If no, then see if you can write what's missing while still keeping the voice of that character or that dialect or whatever is going on that makes your book special. As always, it's important to trust your reader here. Trust that they are at least as interested in your story as you are. Trust that they've been paying enough attention to grab all of the tiny breadcrumbs that you've left. I promise you that at least some of them will have done just that. And treating those readers as anything less would only be insulting to them. Let's pivot now to talking about different kinds of endings. I'll focus on form here because there are simply too many types of endings and ways to do them and they're all so subjective that I don't know going through them individually would be helpful to you. If I'm wrong on that, feel free to let me know and we can do a whole episode just looking at endings that exist and whether or not they work. And we can look at books, movies, everything that's a story. For now, though, I'll look at conventions for endings surrounding the different mediums you might be working in. We'll look at flash fiction, short stories, standalone novels, and novels that belong to a series. Let's start with the shortest medium, flash fiction. Flash fiction, as a loose definition, tends to be any complete piece under a thousand words. Some places go up to 1,500, but it's much more common to have the limit at a thousand. As you can imagine, these stories take on a completely different form than the usual storytelling methods we're used to. It's a snippet, a moment in time representative of the larger stories. As such, flash endings sometimes aren't even endings at all. Just as a singular moment doesn't really end, but rather transitions smoothly into the next, a flash piece should end on this moment of change. Depending on the piece, the ending may or may not tell us what change is in store. The more important idea is that as we get a sense that we can't return to whatever moment we left, that's where we end it. This means that flash fiction is the most open-ended of the mediums we're going to look through today. It's okay if this ending isn't really an ending. I don't have to know what every character is going to do from this point on out. I do have to feel like the situation or character or something significant has changed by the time I'm done with the piece. Change, remember, is the crux of storytelling. That's why no matter what your medium, something must be different between the beginning and the ending of the story. Otherwise, why did we read it? I'll read you an incredibly short 100-word flash piece I wrote for a contest a while back. It by no means won the contest, so this is not like a how-to on writing flash fiction, but I want you to pay attention to the ending of the piece. What has changed from the time I started to the time I ended? So listen closely. The smell of bread hovers between square tables. Teacups clink gently against their saucers. Onyx eyes glance over worn, traveled pages, while a matching emerald pair ducks below a screen before peeking back over. Crow's feet, the crinkled lines of a smile. A sip of coffee, the tapping of keys, a bite of buttered toast. They're struggling for greetings, for words, for jokes. A waiter, white shirt, black apron, passes. A table topples. Glass plays its musical shatter symphony, and they kneel to gather the pieces. Fingers meet. Lightning sparks in the space between them, granting courage for murmured possibility. Hello. So this is one of the first things I ever wrote, and of course, 100 words isn't a lot. But you can still see how from the beginning, where the two people are nervously glancing at each other from their separate tables, to the end when they've finally spoken to each other, we get this moment of change. In this way, the piece feels complete, even though in any other medium, it would literally only be the start, maybe even the start of a start. But in Flash, that moment of change counts as an ending. You can see then how knowing your medium will greatly affect what you can do with your ending. Genre will do that as well to an extent. Without getting into all of the details of different conventions of genre endings right this second, 
I encourage you to go through some books you've read that you have really enjoyed in your target genre. How have they ended? What did you like about those endings? Making some sort of chart or list will help you see what is considered normal in your genre, and then you can figure out a way to take those conventions and make them unique for your story. All right, let's move up. Let's talk short stories now. So short stories are, word count-wise, one step up from Flash, and they run anywhere from 1,000 words to about 15,000 words. Some places will take higher word counts as short stories, but in my opinion, if you're running more than 15,000, you're looking at novella territory. And if you're not familiar with word count, most books run about 280 words to the page. So a 15,000 word piece is about 53 pages. That's definitely longer than any short story I've ever read. But let's focus on form rather than structure. A short story is more than one moment of time, like flashes. A short story is a sequence, some series of events and emotions important to the character. While this will also contain change, the difference here is that the short story doesn't end at the moment of change. Instead, think of it more like a chapter. Short stories end not because there's nothing more to tell, but because this particular sequence has finished and is transitioning into another. Now, I'm using the term sequence not in the temporal sense, but in the emotional sense. Short stories can and do successfully jump around in time. They can show memories or simply span years and still work as a short story. The key is that the character is on the same emotional journey throughout the ride. If the subject of the story is focusing on a character learning to trust, for example, then we may see the character jump from being betrayed as by a friend as a child, to being left by a significant other as a teenager, to having their accomplishments taken from them at work as a young adult, before they finally meet someone or maybe rekindle their own self-worth that makes them realize they're not alone and they can actually trust people. The character, throughout all those different points in time, is still in the process of learning the same lesson, so it all fits into the structure of the short story. You can make the logical leap, then, that a short story will end once that emotional sequence for the character has been completed. This doesn't mean that the character has nothing more to tell. It just means that this specific lesson has either been learned or has been failed to learn. Either way, the reader should have some sense of how this will impact the character going forward. If the character has learned to trust, in our example, then the short story might end with the character sitting down to coffee with a new friend. If they have not, the story might end with the character sitting alone in their apartment. Either way, you can see that the life of the character isn't over. You could keep going if you wanted to, but you would no longer be on the same emotional through line. There's a metaphor I really like that Valerie Lakin uses when she describes short story endings. She likens them to a bow wrapped around a package. It looks all nice and neat, but there's two tails sticking out of the ribbon. I like to think of those tails as the word but. The story is done, but. The character has gotten to this place, but. It's the idea that the story could go on, but this particular sequence is all done now. I don't have a short story short enough to put here and have it be useful to you, but I encourage you to check out the, these ones readily available online. I'll put their links in the description of the episode. They're all different genres, and each one has a different take on the way they wrap up the story. Note to yourself which sequence has ended and feels nicely wrapped up, and which emotional sequences linger in the possibility of the reader's mind. So I have three examples. The first one is a speculative example, The Red Thread by Sophia Samatar. And I apologize if I say any of these names wrong. I've only ever read them. The uh, second one is more of a fantasy story, Give Her Honey When You Hear Her Scream by Maria Devana Headley. And the third one, full literary fiction, A Good Man is Hard to Find by Flannery O'Connor. All of them stunning endings, all completely different endings. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, they're all completely free to read, and I'll put the links in the description. The next ending we'll discuss is that of novels. We'll start with novels intended to be standalone works. So with novels, as the word count increases, so does the complexity of the story. 
where short fiction is looking at one emotional sequence, a novel is really looking at multiple. Your main character might be on one quest or plot line throughout the story, sure, but there are subplots and minor characters and different ups and downs that move in that story. Because of that, your novel might end a few times over. You might have to wrap things up a couple different times. Novels, by their nature, are long, and the upside of that for you is that the reader has spent so long with your voice and characters and words that you don't need to nail a wow ending like you do in short fiction or flash. You can let your characters go gently into that good night. You can wave goodbye from the train platform and then turn back and go to the rest of your life. Metaphors aside, a novel ending, one that's meant to stand by itself anyway, should be pretty final. You should wrap up all the loose ends of that bow and tuck them neatly back in. What I'm trying to say is that your ending should feel like an ending. We know where the story goes from here. Maybe it's a happily ever after kind of thing. In that case, even though the characters are still living, we consider the story done because there's no more interesting things to tell. All their troubles are normal troubles. They'll solve them with words and patience like everybody else. Whatever drew us into the story in the first place has been laid to rest, and we as readers can leave knowing we won't be missing anything when our back is turned. If it's not a happily ever after ending, then we can still consider the story done because we realize there is no way the character could get themselves out of whatever has happened to them. In the case of a story like Romeo and Juliet, for example, it's pretty easy because they're both dead. The family decides to lay down their feud, the end. There's nothing more to tell. Could you imagine if we decided to head back to Verona and check on Lady Capulet and how she's getting along in retirement? Maybe that's an interesting story, but it isn't the story of Romeo and Juliet. There's nothing more to tell with those characters, so we know we're done. If you're working on a novel and aren't sure how to end it, consider this. Take a stack of index cards. For each plot or subplot you have, write a quick summary on the index card. So to give you an example, maybe you're writing a fantasy story, and on one index card you might write, Meg is the chosen one. She slays the dragon. Right? That's Meg's whole story. Next card. Her best friend Ian helps her along the way. He dies a glorious death. Card number three. The wizard Greta is hated throughout the kingdom. She uses the dragon to inflict pain and misery until she meets Meg, who treats her like a human being, and then they band together to fight the dragon together. They settle down, and Greta isn't so lonely anymore. Three characters, three subplots, right? So, of course, these are only examples, but you want to write the plots and subplots that work for you. Once you have all of them, lay them out in front of you, then set them in an order that makes the most sense for your story. So in the example we just gave, Ian is probably going to be first because he dies in the middle of the story and that isolates Meg as the chosen one and gives her a point of no return. So index card Ian goes first. Next, Meg will slay the dragon. And then the last one, Greta, will be in a cottage with Meg living out their cottage core dreams. That's what would make sense for this sequence. But you choose whatever makes sense for your story. Lastly, let's talk about novels when they're in a part of a series. This ending is tricky because while you want to give the readers a satisfying ending to the book and thus justify the 200 plus pages of story they've spent with you, you also want to entice them into the next novel. I like to think of this type of ending as a door. You want that door open just a crack right? Mostly closed. The characters have achieved their character arts. The subplots have been taken care of. But just like with the short story, we're really leaning on this concept of but. Like a breadcrumb trail to the next book. Maybe the villain isn't really dead. Or maybe it's the happy ever after, except something starts to go wrong. So you kind of want to leave on this moment of uncertainty. Some books, especially ones that have been sold in multiple book packages, can afford to end their novels on straight-up cliffhangers, like this is episode 4 of a Netflix binge. I don't necessarily mind that, 
but it takes a lot longer for a book to come out than it does for the next episode of Netflix to start playing. It's happened to me where I've straight up not bought books in the store because they are, you know, part three of a series. The last one ended on a cliffhanger and I don't remember the ending of the last book enough to justify immediately starting the next one. I feel like I have to go back and reread the series and then I don't have time to do that. So I just don't buy the book. That's not to say a cliffhanger ending can't be done well. Literally one of my favorite books of all time ends that way and the next book starts two seconds after the last ending and it works for that series. But it is something to keep in mind. All right, thank you all for listening and I hope this talk was helpful to you. Please feel free to go back, pause, or replay any part you want to hear again. If you really like the episode, feel free to leave a review or share it with someone else you think would like to learn about final sentences. Bonus points if that person is in the process of revising a work in progress. If you're interested in telling us a story about your own writing experience, share your work with us, or you just want to say hi, you can send an email to writeturn at gmail.com. That's W-R-I-T-3. T-U-R-N at gmail.com, or you can click the link in the description. If you'd like to engage with the community in other ways, you're welcome to subscribe to the newsletter at jordanmgriffin.com, which will tell you when new episodes come out. Uh, I also have an Instagram, which will let you know when I upload videos. The link to that will be in the episode description, along with those short stories and everything else that you might need. As always, I wish you all the best in your own writing. Have a wonderful day, and if it's not a good one, I hope that the next one is better. See you next time.